Hello and welcome to a special small gold report on de-dollarization. Local currency should be used in belt and road financing, so says the People's Bank of China's president. People's Bank of China's president encourages use of local currencies along the Silk Road. Does this mean game over for the dollar? Well, first we need to know what the Belt and Road Initiative is. But let's take a look first at what the president of the People's Bank of China said in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative. He said at the same time, the use of local currency will gradually reduce the dependence on the dollar and other major currencies, reducing the risk of rate fluctuations. So we need to know why he said that, what the consequences are of him saying that, and what context he's saying that. So he gave a speech earlier this month entitled loosely translated, a discussion of the construction of all the way investment and financing cooperation relating to the Belt and Road Initiative. And in that, the key sentence, he was talking about the use of local currencies, which brings up people's antennas about what that might mean for the dollar. He said that the advantage of using these local currencies is it mobilizes local savings and global funding. It reduces the cost of exchange. You don't have to go through various steps. You just use the local currency. And it helps maintain financial stability because the countries using their own currencies, local currencies, gain confidence in those currencies. So their underlying financial stability builds as their currencies become more widely accepted and people save in the local currencies and then they don't have to exchange them as much so that they're it's a more efficient way of financing local projects rather than going through the dollar okay so he's talking about the belt and road objectives in the initiative and those objectives are it is a regional trade agreement with china coordinating and facilitating the progress of all of these countries along with used to be the Silk Road. Um, if you click here, if you go to the website, there's not going to go through the list of all the countries that are involved, but if you know your geography, it's basically Central Asia and then Asia as well. And you can click on the link there on this. I'll put a link to the blog post and you can go and there's a lot of links in this blog post that you might want to check out. So you may even want to follow along by opening up another browser and taking a look. So the idea is to connect these countries more closely and promote mutually beneficial cooperation to a new high and a new form. It's a very noble uh, objective, but basically it's a free trade agreement with China trying to enhance the trade amongst the countries and not just the, the trade, but to finance projects to enhance and increase the economic profile of the countries along the Silk Road because if they don't have anything to trade, it doesn't matter what you set up. There has to be a, not just the ability to trade, but there has to be something to trade. Now, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, the President of the People's Bank of China noted the progress that they've made so far in this speech. China has established local RMB clearing arrangements in 23 countries and regions. They've designated local RMB clearing lines, and then China has developed their uh, cross-border payment system, the CIPS, and there are many participants, uh, there are financial institutions that are involved in the CIPS and from countries all along the Silk Road. So basically he's saying that they've made progress in establishing the RMB as at least, if not on an international global basis, but certainly they've made a lot of progress on making the RMB useful and available for use in the along the Silk Road. He also noted that uh, the RMB has now been included in the IMF's SDR currency basket and that Poland, Russia and other countries have successfully issued these RMB bonds denominated in RMB, not their local currency, or they call them Panda debt. So if you want to see a list of all that he didn't mention, but I have a list of the China Belt and Road Initiatives. You click on that link. 
So China seems to want a bigger say in the world economy, no doubt. The bigger they get, the more financial clout they have, the more geopolitical influence they have, the more military influence they have. And obviously, they want to expand their trade in the region and they want to help develop the region so they can expand their trade. I mean, they have a very brisk trade with Europe as their number one trading partner, the United States is second. But, but the countries closest to them, especially along the Silk Road, they're kind of not at the same level of trade, as I mentioned, because they don't have as much economic GDP for them to trade with. So China, and this is where we start to talk about game over, China doesn't want to abolish its U.S. and Western businesses. What it wants to do is build its Eastern business, which basically is very small compared to its Western business. And I don't think any rational country would want to destroy their sacred cow or even just cash cow it doesn't have to be sacred just to make a political statement i think what they want to be is powerful globally and one way of doing that is by increasing their the trade in their local region so what impact is this going to have on the dollar well i say that the belt and road initiative is less about a reduction in dollar use and more about an increase in new finance and new wealth creation and trade that will happen in RMB and local currencies outside the dollar. So I don't think it means game over or the end of the dollar, but rather a boost to these local currencies. Hoarding gives currencies more value than use of currencies. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Let's use Bitcoin and gold as examples. Bitcoin. A few years back, many Bitcoin aficionados were predicting higher prices, correctly they were, on the I believe incorrect premise that increased Bitcoin adoption and use would drive the price higher as more and more businesses and people used Bitcoin to transact business. Now back in February 2014, I wrote that more businesses accepting bit Bitcoin would not create more demand for Bitcoin, unless such business is a mandated Bitcoin use, but rather create more places to use and sell Bitcoin. So if increased adoption occurred, as I was, I was talking about in February 2014, that would create selling at a lower and eventually more stable price because back in 2014, the number of Bitcoin holders were fewer. And if more places would accept Bitcoin, that just meant there were more places for people to sell their Bitcoin. But that's not what happened over the last three years or so. Bitcoin did indeed rise from the $650 price in February to over $1,500 today, but it wasn't because of the increase in use. Rather, it was because it was hoarded as a liquid store of value. And the more it rose, the more people wanted to hold on to it, which meant they wouldn't sell it. And then the more it rose, the more other people wanted to buy it. And there were fewer people that had it to sell, that were willing to sell it. So that created a very nice lack of supply and there wasn't much more bitcoin coming on board as the years went on because half of it had already been created and it's a lot harder to create new bitcoin now but you got more people that want it and you have fewer people that already have it that are willing to sell it so that boosts the price not increased adoption similarly with gold let's take a look Gold hasn't been used as a currency since the 1930s. Even when dollars were exchangeable for gold under Bretton Woods from 1944 to 1971, countries would use the dollar in their, in their transactions almost exclusively more than they would use direct gold exchanges because countries back then would much rather have preferred to settle in dollars than they would to drain their gold. So even though the dollar was exchangeable into gold and supposedly as good as gold, countries weren't stupid. They would say, all right, if the dollar is good as gold, here's your dollar in exchange. We're going to use that. That's the world reserve currency. And when the IMF, for example, asked Italy to settle a portion of its uh, obligations back to the IMF in gold, Italy said, no way. And they threatened to leave the IMF um, system at the time. So if you want to hear more about that, see more about that, you can see the Small Gold CIA and Gold series. It explains how countries, even under the so-called Bretton Woods gold standard, did not really view the dollar as good as gold. They viewed gold as good as gold. And also, the individuals weren't allowed to exchange their dollars for gold from 1944 to 1971. So the last time that average everyday people used gold 
as a currency. It was back in the 1930s. So gold rose immediately after Nixon ended the gold standard when it was officially removed from the global financial system. And since 1971, gold has become an attractive reserve asset for banks to hold, i.e. hoard, and for individuals to hoard as a store of liquid value. People do not buy gold so they can spend it other than gold money. But I think even people that invest in gold money don't do a lot of spending with it. They Most of the people far uh, the largest group of people who have gold have it to hold it not to spend it and that's what gives gold its value is the hoarding just like bitcoin it's not the use it's the holding so what does that mean for treasuries treasuries same thing so let's bring this back to well if people are going to use the dollar less in transactions well that just means they're not going to be selling their treasuries as much now maybe they will be but the point is that treasuries are the most widely held reserve asset in the world and if Silk Road countries trade or finance in other countries, that doesn't mean they're going to go out and dump all of their U.S. Treasury bonds. Remember, this is new business, too, they're talking about. They're talking about $500 billion worth of financing for new business along the Silk Road. Treasury bonds, like gold, like Bitcoin, are a liquid store of value in today's negative interest rate environment. Yes, they continue can make it. We're not debating whether Bitcoin is better, there's limited supply of Bitcoin, same with gold, treasuries they can print forever. But in the international monetary system, treasury bonds are a liquid store of value, especially in today's negative interest rate environment. Dollars held in the form of U.S. treasuries, I think, will continue to be held in countries using the dollar as tra transactional currency. So if you're in the United States, Europe, Australia, Latin America, Japan, and China, and you're doing trade amongst yourselves, in dollars, you're going to hold U.S. Treasury bonds, even though these countries may rebalance their reserves. Also, as Belt and Road countries gain economic provenance from these financing deals, they'll start to increase their trade with countries outside the region and trade with countries using the dollar. Well, that will mean they'll probably want to hold some of their reserves in U.S. Treasuries. So I've been saying since 2015, when the Fed started making noise about raising interest rates, I said they will raise interest rates. When people are saying they can't raise, they won't raise, they'll never raise, whatever. I said, no, they will. And the reason they will, not at the pace that they claim they will, that was just talking it up a bit much, was the sole reason, I think, is to keep Treasury bonds attractive because the United States needs that debt financing. And you make treasury bonds attractive by paying a positive rate of interest while other sovereign entities offer no interest or negative yields. The big problem the United States had was QE. They went to zero in interest rates. They printed the $4.5 trillion. That could have and should have destroyed the dollar. But they have done a pivot while have encouraged Japan and Europe to go negative or, or zero and to do their own QEs. Now the treasury bonds are, are a step ahead of other bonds because they pay interest and they keep talking about continuing to raise interest rates. So that will keep the, the U.S. Treasuries as an attractive reserve asset. Now, the dollar may one day indeed collapse, but I think that collapse is more likely to come from domestic fiscal irresponsibility that increased trade along the Silk Road using local currencies. Let me know what you think. Also, please subscribe to Small Gold, subscribe to this channel, tell your friends, uh, follow us on Twitter. And if you're interested in buying gold or silver, please consider doing so through the Small Gold links below this YouTube on the, and also on the Small Gold site from SD Bullion, BGSC.com, Golden Eagle Coins, Muddy Metals Exchange. And also, please consider donating not just consider, please do donate via PayPal, via Bitcoin, or become a patron on Patreon. The links are all below and on the Small Gold site. Thank you.